a world filled with chaos, we find this innate desire for order. There's disorder all around us, but yet our soul, our mind, our spirit, all that we are longs for order and structure. In fact, we find this tension. We live in it all the time. We want to understand the world around us. We need it to make sense. But chaos creates discontinuity in our mind. It causes disruption. We know there's something in ain't in us that desires order, a well-ordered life, that is. Well, there are a number of industries that try to meet this need. One particularly is a self-help industry. According to some, every year, approximately 15,000 books are published in the self-help category. That's a lot of books. That's a lot of help. When you think about it, now is it translating? Is that industry producing results? And we look around to our society and it appears sometimes that there's even more disorder. Maybe we can even look at people and I would think that if you would get all that help, Maybe we'd be more productive, but we look and by and large it appears our society becomes more lazy. With all this self-help, why aren't we being more productive? Well, that's because the entire industry is built on a fallacy. Now, several fallacies, that is. First of all, it's built on the fallacy that you are the answer. There's the, there's the number one fallacy in that entire industry that somehow you're the answer or that you could find peace, harmony and order apart from a relationship with God. You can read all 15,000 of those books and just keep repeating it. You won't find what your heart and soul are longing for. But you will find them in a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we come to the book of Proverbs, I want to talk about a biblical theology of a well-ordered life. Now, time won't allow us to look at the entire book of Proverbs. I'm just going to look at the first three chapters. And let me encourage you. In the past, we've had initiatives here to read the whole Bible in a year. That's a good thing. It's not something that, that you should stop doing if you're doing it. We reward our children to accomplish it. We compensate them at the end of the year for accomplishing that goal. Those who've read through the scripture all the way through the year, they receive $120 at the end of that year. And we believe that it's worth investing. I'm investing in them. So, yes, read the Bible through if that's your method. There's a board out there that we sign each year when we commit to these things, but we've expanded it. If you're committed to memorizing the scripture, to praying the scripture, to reading through the scripture, sign that board out there. That's what we do every year, okay? So when we think about reading the book of Proverbs, I've heard people say, I read a proverb a day. That is a chapter a day is what they mean. I've heard others as part of their reading plan. Let me encourage you to do this this year. Read the book of Proverbs very slow. So slow that you don't even get through the whole book this year. Let me challenge you to do this. Don't go any farther in the book until you've mastered what's before you. You say, well, I'd never get past the first verse. I understand that. I don't mean that level of mastery. But until you've been able to be fully saturated with the teaching and see it resonating and being applied in your life in a way that is, if you will, measurable in the sense that you can see the change and impact it's having, don't move on. There's too much there for you just to just run off and move on when what we're to understand is that the Holy Spirit inspires the book of Proverbs in a certain order, the order that we've received it. Therefore, that's the order we should read it, meditate on, reflect upon, and apply it. You shouldn't move on until you've applied what is before you. So therefore, I don't think you'll get all the way through the book of Proverbs this year. That's okay. And so as we look at it, I want to talk about a biblical theology of a well-ordered life, and we see this in the book of Proverbs, but not just the book of Proverbs, because we never look at any one book of the Bible in isolation. We have a divine library, and we understand them in the totality of the story. And so this framework that I'm putting before you is a framework of how we read the whole Bible. That is creation, rebellion, also known as the fall, Genesis chapter 3, 
redemption, and then that final consummation. Now, when we think about in creation, there's order. If you, if you just consider for a moment astronomy, you can look out, you can see in astrology, depending on, on how you want to carve this up, and we have a discipline called arithmetic. We use that as math. Some of you hate math. That's okay. But we use it and we measure and we can see the order and the structure of the universe. So the heavens declare the glory of God. It shows us the order and structure of creation. Of course, we can look at even the human body. We can look at creation itself and recognize that there's an order to it. That is, there's a design to it. There's meaning to it. And all of that is meant to glorify God. That order is to show us and point us to God whose mind is far greater than we can imagine, whose person is far greater than we could ever even comprehend. And so creation points us to God, and an ordered creation calls us to glorify God. Well, in the rebellion comes disorder. In that disorder, we choose to ignore God and ignore His ordered creation, and we bring in what? Disorder and chaos into our lives. But in that disorder and chaos, we think it would be fun. We, we actually say, well, of course, I can have it my own way. I can do my own thing. It's going to be great. You don't know what you're talking about. Just wait till I'm on my own, said every teenager. <laughs> Somebody says, how old, were, how old were Adam and Eve when they were in the garden? 17. <laughs> I don't know that, by the way. Some of you are like flipping back to Genesis real quick, going to email me on my... On my... <laughs> Never mind. Anyway. I can do it without you, I'll prove you wrong, I'll show you, and then what happens, it usually creates disorder, and it's something like this, there's just that coming back around like, I really didn't understand it all, can you help me? Anyway, so we see it even in our own relationships, but this disorder, it, it causes this constant tension in our life, where we long for order, we long for structure, we want a well-ordered life, but we keep pursuing the disorder. Why is that? What is, what is pursuing the disorder? It's pursuing sin. That's what it is. Sin is disorder in our life. When things are out of order, when there's sin in our life, that's chaos in our life. That's bringing disorder into our life. Whenever a relationship's broken, that's disorder. We're called to live in harmony and unity and peace with God and with our fellow man. But sin brings chaos and disorder. We see it all around us, but yet we long for order. A well-ordered life, a structured life, a life that makes sense and has meaning. Well, where do we find that? We find it in the redemption that is only given through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other redemption anywhere else. We find it in Him, and in Christ, we, our lives begin to be reoriented. Not only our lives, but all of creation is being reoriented so that it and we will glorify God. We think about this word, it's a big word, it's a theological word, so I want to unpack it for you. It's called sanctification. Here's what it means. It means the process of becoming holy. You say, that's a tall order. Well, maybe better said, so that we can really grasp it, becoming more like Christ, growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. This would be, that is, moving from disorder, from chaos, so when, when you give your life to Jesus... Some of you think that you're going to snap your finger and all the disorder that you've spent a lifetime creating and that us collectively have spent lifetimes creating is going to suddenly be removed? No, no, no. So we're going to have Theology 101 now. Justification is a word we use when someone gives their life to Jesus, when someone calls upon the name of Christ to be saved. Justification is that word that means declared not guilty. It's not just as if you've never sinned. No, that's not very helpful at all. It's declared not guilty. Why? Because he took all the guilt on him. So that's what happens when you give your life to Jesus. You are declared not guilty. You are adopted in the family of God. You're united with Christ. There's a lot of concepts there, okay? Well, before we get to that final state, that perfected state, when we're with God, there's, a, there's this process that's happening. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and we call that sanctification. So between the two bookends of your salvation, your justification, and your glorification, there's the process of sanctification, becoming more like Christ. This is the ordering, maybe even the reordering, of a previously disordered life under the headship of Christ. 
So there's no well-ordered life apart from redemption and sanctification in Christ. That, those are the foundational elements to a well-ordered life. I think to myself that every year at this time, we, we make a list of resolutions, things we're going to do that we don't. But we say we're going to do them, but we don't. It's a fun game. I think of it like a, like a game we play with ourselves. It's like a mental gymnastics. I haven't done this all year, but this time when I travel around this huge ball of fire in the sky, I'm going to do X, Y, or Z differently. That'll make me happy. I just do these things differently. Well, it doesn't last long, and we realize we don't get happiness in that. We don't find satisfaction in that. There's nothing wrong with living a disciplined life. In fact, we talk about that. But the problem is when we put our hope in our ability to create resolutions and ability, the so-called ability to keep them. So here is the point of this, is that sanctification isn't about making resolutions. It's like, well, I'm going to serve Jesus more this year. That's my New Year's resolution. I'm going to tell more people about Jesus this year. How about this? How about we seek to be more like Christ with the help of his Holy Spirit? All of those are byproducts of that. I don't need to create a list of all the resolutions I'm going to make this year. I have one purpose for which I exist, and that purpose hasn't changed because a date on the calendar has changed. It's to glorify God as a follower of Jesus Christ. What's it mean to be a follower of Christ? I'm glad you've asked. You've come to the right place. Here's what it means. It means to be a learner means to be a learner. The word disciple means follower or learner. That's what we're talking about here. So if we're going to look at the book of Proverbs for a well-ordered life, we need to recognize that it begins with being a follower of Jesus, one who has a teachable spirit, one who is willing to learn. You know, it's funny. I don't know why this is. Maybe it's because I'm a pastor. People are always interested in telling me how much they know. I get that a lot. They tell me how much they know about the Bible I'm always willing to listen because I have a teachable spirit. They tell me how much they know about the world, about politics. And my favorite, they tell me how much they know about my job. <laughs> you missed that. Or some of you are under conviction because your New Year's resolution is to be nice to the pastor this year. But anyway, let's move on quickly. So the goal here is to obtain wisdom and knowledge. But the world's wisdom and knowledge? No, divine wisdom and knowledge and we understand the foundation of this is a relationship with God. So if we're going to obtain wisdom and knowledge through instruction, we have to have a teachable spirit. And at the foundation of all that is knowing God, then we recognize being a disciple of Christ is be a learner. So this is a lifelong pursuit of learning more. You and I, I can tell you why I know that you don't know all there is to know about God, his word, and Christ. Here's why I know. Because we're still on this side of eternity. You haven't arrived yet. There's always more for us to learn. I don't mean learning as if there's some secret knowledge out there that's to be whispered in the ear like the Gnostics. All that we have that we need is in the Word of God. What I mean by that is that have you exhausted all the teachings of Scripture? Do you fully comprehend and understand all of them? For 2,000 years, great men and women have, have striven to understand these things, and we find that the human mind has limitations. I'll give you an example. Because if the goal is to obtain knowledge and wisdom through instruction, let's think about this for a minute. Pick one attribute of God. Holiness, love, mercy, grace. Where are some of the others? Wrath, justice. And I want you, in your mind, to pick that attribute and try to imagine God in his perfection in that attribute. Okay, try to imagine perfect love. Have you fully comprehended God as love in your mind at that moment? Of course you haven't. Your mind has severe limitations. If you could fully comprehend God as love or God as holy, He is not God. In other words, He always has to be beyond the, the extent or reach of the human mind. Now, yes, he is love, and we can comprehend his love to a degree, but can you fully comprehend the magnitude of God's love? 
No, of course not. So there's always more to learn. So as we learn, first of all, we must have a teachable spirit. The book of Proverbs is structured. If you read through it, you're going to notice over and over, you'll hear the father saying to the son, that is an earthly father to an earthly son, son, hear my instructions. You hear that over and over and over. The book is set up not as a, some sort of magic spells that we pull verses out and we claim them strangely out of order or we, we try to extract them and then make them prophetic. Proverbs are, are general observations about the world around you. These proverbs have been divinely inspired so that we would have wisdom about the world from God and that we'd be able to impart that wisdom to our children. So in order, to, in order to teach, you have to be what? Teachable. If you aren't teachable, you can't teach. In fact, a sign that you've learned something is your ability to teach it and to teach it over and over. We must have a teachable spirit. To me... It is, it is not impressive for someone to tell me how much they know. I'm, I find the older I get, the less I'm impressed. What impresses me is someone who pursues knowledge in Christ. Now, that's impressive. It's impressive to see somebody pursue Christ and pursue knowledge of Christ. That is impressive. That gets my attention. That is something I will stand in awe of, watching somebody with all that they are, all that they have, pursue Christ and knowledge of him. Fill room full of bravado and big talk about all the ends of theology and the finer points you know, and I'm ready to leave. I find that exhausting. Who wants to be around this braggadocious nonsense? No one. But I tell you what, you fill the room full of servants. Well, I want to be there. You must have a teachable spirit. To be in leadership in this church, you must have a teachable spirit. Now, we learn from many sources, but our ultimate source of truth is the Word of God. And so we must have a teachable spirit being willing to learn the Word of God. And so let me ask you this question. It's rhetorical in nature. Does the Word of God support your beliefs or inform your beliefs? Because there's a difference. And if you have a teachable spirit, the Word of God informs your beliefs. For those who don't have a teachable spirit, they use the Bible to support their beliefs. There is a difference. I can hear beliefs, I can hear things being said sometimes, and I'm thinking to myself, that's a proof text, that, that somebody starts with that belief because somebody told them, and they go to the scriptures. This is not a teachable spirit. This is not a teachable spirit. I can listen, you can line up cult members in my living room, one right after another, and they've got a belief system, and they use the scripture to teach their belief system. Does the Scripture inform our beliefs, or do we try to use it to support our beliefs? I refuse to use the Scripture to try to support my beliefs. I want the Scripture to be my authority. And if the Scripture is my authority and informs my beliefs, there's a difference. If the Scripture is supporting my beliefs, then I'm the authority. Then we're no different than any other established church. Now listen, I'm not here to start and pick on Catholics. That's not what I mean to do. But let me tell you this. In the Catholic Church, the Pope is the authority, the Cardinals are the authority, and the Scripture is subservient to them. This is a Baptist Church, and in the Baptist Church, we have no Pope, no Cardinal. We have the Lord Jesus Christ as our shepherd, and His Word is authoritative here. I don't care who your favorite theologian is, your favorite teacher or preacher, the Word of God is our authority. We don't pursue men. We don't follow men. We follow Christ. And his word is our authority. Show me a man with a teachable spirit. I will show you a man that God can use. So not only would we have a teachable spirit, we better have a plan. I've marked these spots in my Bible in the book of Proverbs as I read through them. And so I'm trusting that you will read through and you will see this. But I'm, I'm taking us through chapters 1 through 3. And here's the next thing we find. He, he tells his son to, to be teachable, but also to have a plan to resist sin and temptation. He tells him how to recognize it. And if you don't have a plan, let me tell you this. I'm going to use a word. Some of you, you're used to being offended by now, so you'll just, you'll shrug it off. So here we go. You can either have a loser mentality or a winner mentality. And I'm going to tell you right now, as Christians, we're more than conquerors in Christ. I'm not going to accept a loser mentality. I don't think so. Christ and his church will prevail. We need to adopt a winner mentality. A loser mentality says, I'm just going to wing it. I don't have a plan. Now, I'm not talking about if you're a free spirit, you're a loser. I don't mean that. I love a free spirit. I, I absolutely am in, absolutely in love with a free spirit, okay? I just want to be clear here. But if, honestly, if you don't have a plan to recognize and resist temptation, you will be devoured. 
Listen to me. I'm telling you, I've had countless people sit in front of me as their pastor, and you're hearing about their disordered life and how they're being devoured, and, and you don't hear a plan. It's they they want to come through the office, and listen, I love you. Come to my office anytime, but my office is not a drive through line at the McDonald's where you're going to get something quick. That's not how this works. If you've spent 50 years creating disorder because you refuse to plan to recognize and resist sin, we're not going to fix it in a day. But I tell you what, with the Word of God, we can begin to recognize. And recognizing the temptations around us, we can have a plan of action and developing a plan of action so that we can walk with the Lord, so that we can grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. When you allow disorder in your life, it is pulling you off track constantly. He's telling his son, recognize the temptation. Recognize the evil that's coming for you, and have a plan to resist it. And that plan, listen to me, never includes you resisting it alone. Oh, you, I'm strong enough. I can handle it. Again, you're a liar, and you're lying in church. You cannot resist the devil on your own. You need people in your life, people who are seeking wisdom, people who are also teachable. People who are learning, who are on the journey to be more like Christ as well. Be a wisdom seeker. As we progress through the text, we find ourselves towards the end of chapter 1, and we we see this call to be a wisdom seeker, somebody who is constantly hungry for the Word. And I'm going to tell you this, a mark of a Christian is somebody who's hungry for revelation from God's Word. I, I I will not beg you to love God's Word. I will not beg you to read God's Word. Because listen to me, I'm not going to talk to you like your babies, if, if you have to be talked to that way, then here's the conversation I need to have with you. You need to give your life to Christ. That's the conversation we need to have. Because if you have to, if somebody's got to guilt trip you into seeking wisdom from God, I'm asking the question, do you know God? Because it says here that the, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fool despise wisdom and instruction. So which are we? Are you saying, Pastor, today I'm I'm a fool? If you've not given your life to Jesus Christ, you are a fool. And you're living a foolish life. You say, I can't stand this. I'll never be back here again. Well, let me tell you the gospel before you leave. There's a holy God who is perfect in every way, and we are sinful in rebellion, and your rebellion is even being shown right now in your unwillingness to recognize that you are a fool without Christ. But guess what? Jesus Christ loves fools, and he shows the foolishness of preaching to save unbelievers. And if you give your life to Jesus Christ, you can ignore me for the rest of it, but you will have eternal life in him through his name. There's the good news. Now listen, for those of you who are going to get upset, there are plenty of churches who will give you the addresses where they'll never say anything hard, they'll never tell you anything challenging, and they'll leave you in your your narcissism, they'll leave you in your chaos. I won't leave you there. I refuse to. Even if I make you mad, today we're going to talk about this. Be a wisdom seeker. Don't be lazy. Don't be pathetic. We need thinkers. We need more thinkers. See, let me tell you something. The evil one wants us just to, just to be mindless workers. But God wants us to be thinkers. Because as thinkers, we are leaders. And as leaders, we change the world with the gospel. That's why we need wisdom seekers. Those who seek wisdom from God's word above all else. Look, there's a lot of books you can read. There's a lot of documentaries that you probably shouldn't watch. But anyway, whatever. But nothing can compare to the wisdom that we find in God's Word. Nothing. But also, we need to keep first things first. Keep first things first. That is, seek the Lord your God above all else. There should be no one in your life that compares to the Lord. The relationship you have with Him, listen to me, should come before everyone else. You say, well, my spouse should come first, or my kids are my world. Let me tell you this. They're not, and everything's out of order if God is not first. That will create disorder in your life. You show me a marriage where there's disorder, I will show you people whom God is not first. You show me a family where there's disorder, I will show you a family where God is not first. You say, well, there's been disorder. Well, guess what? God is a God of renewal and revival and second chances. 2022 could have been a total nightmare for you and your family, but today you can make things right with God, put Him first, and start on the path to a life that is well-ordered and glorifies God. That's where we need to be. But now, let me talk about a couple things. Because he talks about honor the Lord with your wealth and receive the Lord's correction. Two things you don't want me to talk about today. Right there. Two of them. You say, there's a lot of things I don't want you to talk about, preacher. Well, there's two of them. You don't want me to talk about your money, and you don't want me talking about your business. 
But God talks about both. So here's what we'll do. I won't talk about your money. Deal? Sounds fair. I'll talk about the Lord's. Okay, so honor the Lord with the first fruits. The tithe belongs to the Lord. Now, you may be driving the tithe. You may be on the, on the water on the tithe. But the tithe belongs to the Lord. And let me tell you, the scriptures are clear on this. Now you say, well, I knew we were going to get into money. Here he goes. This preacher is all about money. No, I'm not. I don't talk to anybody about money. But God's word talks about it, so we're going to talk about it. See, somebody who is who's not honoring the Lord with their first fruits, that life is in disorder. You say, but you don't know the bills I have. And the, in other words, let me help you. So I don't understand the chaos you've created. But we can help you. We can point you to resources to help you get out of that chaos and to live a well-ordered life. Show me somebody who is not generous and not willing to set aside their first fruits for the Lord, and I'll show you somebody whose finances are probably disordered. Not always, but probably. I'll also show you somebody who's probably not leaving a legacy for their children. Because not only the first fruits belong to, you, to the Lord, but you should be leaving a legacy for your children. You say, well, I'm gonna, some people just are going to consume everything they make. Well, my kids are going to have to work for everything they get. So you apparently don't understand the concept of building generational wealth then. And you have what I would call a loser mindset. So here's what a winner mindset has. I'm not leaving something my children to enable them to, to be lazy or to be unproductive or to be useless. No, no. My wife and I have already decided whatever wealth we inherit, we're going to set aside in a trust so that we can continue to provide education for generations that go on. Why? Because providing education and allowing generational wealth to compound for Christians, we understand what we can do with that wealth. What can we do with that wealth, church? We can send missionaries around the world. We can build churches. We can build hospitals. We can build schools. We can build universities. You're talking about, all oh, this university's gone that way. And this. Listen to me. Why in the world are you constantly whining about the devil's university? Why don't we start building our own? And this is what it's going to look like. We're playing the long game here to build generational wealth. And to see you say, well, I, I don't, the church doesn't need any money. Well, you're right. The church doesn't need your money with that sort of attitude. So don't give it because we don't want to miss the blessing from those who are cheerful givers. But a well-ordered life is somebody who understands that everything I have belongs to the Lord. It comes from the Lord. So when I bring the first fruits back to the Lord, it's a recognition that I'd have nothing apart from him. But I'm not just stewarding well the first fruits because I want a well-ordered life. I'm stewarding well what's been kept back. What's been kept back so I can set aside for my children, not to enable them not to work, so that we can pass on generational wealth, so that Christians can stand up and say, we're going to build schools, we're going to build churches, we're going to send missionaries, and we don't need anybody's help. See, the problem is, is that this country attempted to withhold the potential for generational wealth from certain segments of our society for generations. Sometimes we don't want to talk about it, we get uncomfortable. But the reality is part of our great evil and sin was that we decided that certain ethnic groups within our society shouldn't have access to generational wealth. Well, we have laws in place now that are countering those efforts of the evil one, and the church has risen up, and it's time that the church starts saying that, listen, those barriers by God's grace has been removed. Stop consuming everything God blesses you with. Leave something back for your children so that generations from now we can continue this great commission work. It isn't God's call for you to consume every single thing he's given to you. He wants you to build something. I told you I'd make you mad. Now let me go on and continue. There's a difference between giving your first fruits to the Lord and giving to the church. There's a mindset difference. See, when you quote unquote give to the church, you think the church owes you something. You think you've bought stock in the church. You deserve service or a response because of the money you gave to the church. While this is legally a nonprofit, that's just a classification for the government. This is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ where we bring our first fruits with no strings attached. We bring those first fruits here because God has blessed us with, with health and prosperity, and we bring those to honor Him. But we don't just bring those in, and this is that word of correction that we should receive. Don't tell me that you are justified in not having something substantial set aside for your children. That's a loser mindset. That is saying to your children that all the struggle and hardship I had to endure 
to get to where I'm at today. You should have to endure all that same struggle and hardship. What if we did this? What if we took a different approach and say, look at all the hard work that God has blessed me to be able to do to acquire this so that I could glorify him with it. Now, what I want to do is I want to take that foundation and build it up a couple steps. And then I want my kids to work just as hard, if not harder, and build that up a couple steps so that they can receive education and have opportunities so that the church of Jesus Christ can be expanded to every vocation. You're complaining about doctors, you're complaining about lawyers, you're complaining about politicians, you're complaining about leaders, and you keep complaining about it, but I don't, I don't hear anybody saying, why don't we set aside some generational wealth so that we can send out the next group of doctors, lawyers, politicians, educators, school board members. Why don't we start having that conversation in the church? Instead of complaining and saying, Jesus, just come back and get us because we let it go for 50 years and now we don't know what to do. Let's play the long game. And the long game is, let's set aside generational wealth, not to enable put it in a trust you say oh you don't know my kids they'll burn it up they'll do all kinds of stuff look I know kids I've got kids I understand that put it in a trust here's the lawyer coming out of me put it in a trust okay with a trustee and determine they have to go to school or vocational training or something and then from there at a certain age of maturity that they could obtain that and then pass that on you say I feel like I've come to a seminar you haven't this is a sermon but it's a sermon on listen we've got to play the long game Stop burning up everything, spinning everything, and then imagining somehow that we're going to bless the next generation. That's why we've set aside the Joseph Project Fund in this church. We have been blessed beyond measure financially here. And we've set aside part of that in the Joseph Project Fund. And so that we can set back something for the next generation and the next generation. So you say, Pastor, you're preaching this. Are we living it? I'm living it personally. You say, oh, did you, were, you, were you born in the wealth? No. No, you don't know me. No. I shoveled out stalls. I shoveled more manure than any man ever wants to come near. I'll tell you that right now. I had to hoe gardens. I had to do back-breaking work. So no, that's not the case. But I'm determined that what God's blessed me with to leave something back for my children. And my wife and I are praying that I never have to tap into my retirement. That's our prayer. That's our prayer, that we never have to. You're like, that's, that, that's your retirement. I don't look at it like that. I look at it like this. I got seven kids who are all going to get married, and they're going to have kids, and I want to see the kingdom of Christ expanded because I'm sending them into vocations where they're going to be world changers. We need to adopt that winner mentality. That's what it looks like when we adopt a winner mentality, and we're going to adopt that as a church. We're setting aside what God has blessed us with so that the next generations will be able to have a school. You say, we're starting a school, kindergarten and first grade. You're right. But what if God would bless us someday not just to have a school but to have our own university? Oh, pastor, your dreams are big. Maybe they're not my dreams. Maybe they're God's. Maybe it's what God has for this church. So do we need all the new things? I'm going I'm to get off the notes. There's so much else I'm going to say. I'm not even going to go any farther. I got like three other things to say. I'm not going to say anything else. I'm going to say this. It's time the Baptist church grow up. I'm being serious. I don't know why the Lord's leading me this way, but he is. The church needs to grow up. Part of growing up is recognizing that we don't need all the latest things and then talk about how we can't provide our children with a, pri a premier Christian education. Don't come in here poor-mouthing me. I'm going to lose half my church members over this. I'm, don't come in here poor-mouthing how you can't afford to provide your children with a Christian education. Some of you, I understand, you, there's, there's legitimate situations where you can't why don't why don't you seek me out why don't we find ways that we can partner when you maybe you've been blessed with wealth maybe you could partner with a family to ensure that there's generational change maybe you could partner with somebody to see that happen you know but we're going to have the latest cell phone all the best clothes a brand new truck i'm going to pick on the guys a little bit a new boat you know all this stuff and you're going to tell me your kids can't go to a christian school i think it's about time the church grows up and enough of that Enough of this, i got to have all the latest stuff, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to withhold blessings from my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. You need to start thinking with the long game and start thinking about five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten generations from now, what that looks like when you decided that you didn't need all the things to fill your self-centered gratification right then or so that you could keep up with somebody else, so that you could have another trip, so that you could look good. Maybe what we need to focus on is glorifying God and setting aside and sacrificing some things so that our kids can have an opportunity to go into places that we we never had access to to preach the gospel 
Why can't one of our kids sit in the White House? Why can't one of our kids sit in the Chamber of Congress? Why can't one of our kids be the governor of the state? Why can't our children be lawyers and doctors and leaders? Why not? Maybe it's because for too long we've been too selfish. It's time the church grow up. I don't know what else to say. I've already told you the gospel. It made most of you mad. Some of you will never see your face again this side of heaven. I don't know what to do. It's one of those moments. You're like, what do you do now, preacher? Well, you tell people to believe in Jesus. That's what you do. Because listen, this is what it's all about. Listen to me. If you never give a dime to this church, you never give a dollar, you never, sur- nothing. Look to me. I'm going to be honest with you. None of that's going to matter in eternity in the sense of your soul. Now, certainly it matters because we're building a church. I don't want you to misunderstand me. We're, God is using us to build something here, something of substance, something that will last, that will far outlast all of us. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't understand half of what I said, and frankly, none of it matters at this point. If you aren't saved at this point in your life, nothing I've said matters. You need to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And look, if you're here and you're saved and you got your feelings hurt, too bad. I'm just telling, too bad. It's, it's time that we stop with this. You got to talk to everybody sweet and nice so they'll want to come back. Look, we're trying to build something here. And if, you, if you're serious about putting your hand to the plow, then help us. We're going to get busy. If you're serious about doing the work of the Lord, you've come to the right place. But if you're looking for somebody that's just going to whisper sweet things into your ears, you're at the wrong place. I'm going to tell you that. You get right with the Lord, you come back, we'll still be here. Because this is God's church. And you'll be welcome back when you get right with the Lord. I say that with all sincerity. If your feelings have been hurt, too bad. You need to get right with the Lord. Start this year out by getting right with the Lord. Stop being selfish and self-centered. Receive the correction from the Lord's word. Seek a well-ordered life under the headship of Christ. Let us pray.